I'm Karen, and I'm here at the Cool Tool Studio today to share a project with you guys that I'm really excited about. Today, we're going to be using fine silver precious metal clay. I'm recommending Cool Tools FS999 alongside Thompson unleaded transparent enamels to make plique-a-jour enameled earrings. Plique-a-jour translates to light of day, and I love this technique for the beautiful transparency you're able to achieve. Transparent enamel is placed into holes made in the silver and allows light to pass through, creating this beautiful kind of stained glass effect. I'm recommending earrings for this project because you wouldn't want to make charms for a bracelet or a low hanging pendant that could potentially knock against something. Since this is glass with without a back, it's unsupported enamel, they're very fragile, and if you were to knock them against something, there is potential for them to break. Also, by hanging them from your ears and away from your body, there's opportunity for light to pass through, really showcasing the beautiful transparency of this technique. First, we will be cutting our pattern into fine silver precious metal clay, which is a huge time saver from the traditional plique jour method where you're using a handsaw to pierce out the shapes that you want to fill with enamel. Then, once we've fired our fine silver precious metal clay, we're going to enamel these earrings by wet packing enamel into the cells that we've created. Finally, we will be stoning and sanding the surface of both the enamel and the metal to bring it down to one smooth, even surface. Here are the tools that we're going to need to complete this project. To start, we're going to need some FS999 fine silver clay. Since we're using enamel, it must be fine silver and not sterling silver. We're going to need some Thompson transparent unleaded enamels. And if you haven't done much enameling, I highly recommend purchasing the Thompson Complete Color Sampler that Cool Tools offers. It's a great little library of all of the colors, and if you haven't done much enameling, it's a great way to get you started. You can test them and see which colors you love before you start investing in purchasing larger amounts of them. I've made all of these earrings from the little baggies and still have plenty left of even my favorite colors. If you know what you like or eventually do run out of a color, they do sell them individually in the cute, convenient little jars. We'll be wet packing our enamel, so we're gonna need a palette and a small brush. This is a 20 o brush that they offer. You'll need a work surface, and I'm using the work surface alongside these punches and templates. Or alternately, you can be using a scalpel that you'll be working with on top of a self-healing mat. We're gonna be firing our enamels on top of a sheet of mica that will be on top of a four inch firing rack. When you get to finishing your enamel, you're gonna need alumdum stones, both 120 grit and 240 grit. And you're gonna follow that up with 240 sandpaper and you're work your way down to 800. Before we dive right in, there are some general design rules that you should keep in mind. First, your earrings need to be flat. When we're enameling them, the piece must be able to lay flat against a sheet of mica. Additionally, we don't want to put any texture into our clay. If enamel were to fall into the low areas of the texture, we will not be able to remove it. When you're planning your pattern, make sure you give yourself an edge. You don't want enamel too close to the edge, so you run the risk of breaking it when you're stoning. Give yourself at least three millimeters for a border and around two millimeters between your enamel cells. Plan how your earring will be hanging because you need to put the holes in now as opposed to once they've been enameled. I'm going to be showing you two ways to go about this project. In the first, we're going to be using templates and punches that Cool Tools offers. And in the second, I'm going to be freehanding a design with a pencil and then using a scalpel. I'm starting with FS999 rolled to three card stick. Any thinner than that, and by the time you've got it stoned and sanded, it's going to be really fragile. In this case, I am working with a template. I'm using fat shields and I'm just gonna gently place it on top of the greenware clay. I'm just gonna use a pencil to mark my outline that I'm then going to follow and cut. At this point, you could either use a scalpel on a self-healing mat as I had mentioned, but I forgot that there are also these awesome Joyce Chen scissors that cut great curves. So I'm gonna head, go ahead and use them to cut out this outline. 
you know, just following that line that I made with the pencil. I find that in this case, it's easier to go ahead and establish your outside edge. That way when you're punching your holes, you're making sure you're not getting too close to it. All right. And again, you wanna make sure you don't forget how you're gonna be hanging these pieces. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with the holes that my earring will be hanging from. And I'm using the precision hole punches here. Knock out that little guy. All right. So there are those. And next I'm just gonna still be using the precision hole punches, but this time I'm gonna be creating the cells that'll be filling with enamel. The largest that I'm working with is about a quarter inch. Any larger than that, and since they won't be any metal to support your enamel, it's likely to crack. Again, be mindful of your edge. I don't wanna get too close to that because then by the time I'm stoning, you could break through that. So I'm just punching out cells that will then be filled with enamel. So I don't feel like I should make you guys watch me do this all day. I think you can kind of get the point that I'm just going to go about creating these little holes that will then be filled with enamel. And I'm just going to fill the whole area. All right. So this guy's good to go now. He's got all of his holes punched and we're gonna move on to the other method that I was talking about. So as I was saying earlier, this technique always reminds me of stained glass. So I kind of based this design off of a stained glass window that I just simplified. Um, I just used a pencil to super gently put the lines in. You wanna make sure you're not scratching too hard and actually gonna affect the surface of the clay. And then I've got my scalpel here and I'm gonna be cutting out those cells. Unlike before, where I cut the outside first, since we're removing so much more material, I recommend starting with the inside shapes and then we'll cut the edge so we don't tear it as we're removing material. I find it's easier to make all my cuts in one direction first. Like I said, we're just following your pencil lines. And they're just kind of a general map for you. So also notice that I'm not cutting out these cells like completely one at a time. Um, for example, we'll go ahead and try one. If I were to remove this guy all the way and then try to cut out his neighbor, since this isn't there to support that anymore, when I go to do this piece, it's gonna wanna pull that, and I could tear at that junction. So, just makes yourself, your life a little easier if you go ahead and kind of give yourself your lines to cut before you actually start pulling out material. So, just go ahead and cut out all of these areas, and then we'll catch back up. Now that I've got all of the inside pieces removed, we're gonna cut the outside. But first, again, we really don't wanna forget how our earring's gonna be hanging. So, since I didn't really give myself enough room for a precision hole punch here, I'm just gonna gently make a hole with my needle. And then we're ready to dive right in with the scalpel again and cut out our outside edge. This edge has been cut away. This will be a good time to do any cleanup if you need to, but since we are working in greenware with a scalpel, and in this case, also in greenware just with precision punches, you might not have that much cleanup to do. However, you can go ahead and clean up that edge. It'd be easier to do it now than after you fire it. All right, now these are good to go, and we're gonna fire them in accordance to the schedule for FS999. This has been fully fired and cool. 
And now we're ready to dive into the enameling, which in my opinion is a fun part. We basically have a glorified coloring book here. Um, so we're working on top of a sheet of mica, and that's just to keep it so even while we're working as well, your enamel's not gonna run behind it, and it kind of gives you a backing to work on top of. In my palette here, I've got rose purple, Concord grape, and heron blue, and I've just added a little bit of water. If you'll notice, my enamel's not too wet. I'm able to pick it up, and it sticks to itself, but it's not so runny that it's gonna slide all over on me. And that's gonna be important, because if you were to be working very wet, when you go to put it in your cells, it could slide behind, and then you would have to spend a lot of time stoning all that off. So I'm just picking up the enamel with my brush. I know some people like to use packing tools, um, but I find that when you're working this small, it's easiest to just pick it up with a brush and place it into the cells that you made. This is going to have several layers of packing and firing. So you want to work thin. Make sure you go all the way up to your edges. If you have a thin spot there, when you get to stoning, it could potentially crack away. So, some people like to size their enamel or wash it prior to use. Um, I'm not that particular, but if that's something you're interested in, we do have a video that shows you all about that. Um, essentially, the thicker particles tend to be more transparent, so people will wash out or sift out the thinner ones. I'm not that worried about it, so I'm just using it straight out of the jar. So again, you want to make sure you fill the hole completely and try to spread it to be even. If you have a thin spot, it's going to fire before the thicker area and it could probably pull away from the edge. You're not going to fill it all the way to the top because again, we're trying to work kind of thin. That'll decrease our chances of getting bubbles and cracks. So I just got some on top of my metal there. No big deal. I'm just going to dip into the water section here, my rinse part of my palette, and then wipe it away. You will make your life so much easier if you get rid of stray enamel at this point instead of having to stone it all away. So I'm just going to continue this and fill all my cells. And make sure you're filling all the cells evenly. If I were to put just this much in this guy and leave them like that, whereas this guy is much thicker, by the time this guy is fusing. This guy's going to be completely overfired and shrunk away. So try to keep things consistent. Now I'm just going to go ahead and fill up all of these cells. So now I've got all of my cells filled. And again, I tried my best to be consistent and even about that. And then I went ahead and cleaned up all the little grains that I could off of the metal surface. So now we're good to take this piece directly, still on top of the mica, to the kiln to fire. But before we head over there, I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we're only firing to orange peel. For those of you who don't know what that means, three stages of firing enamel. The first of which is called a sugar coat, and that is when the enamel just kind of begins to fuse to itself. It's still very readily identifiable as individual grains. Um, looks like sugar. <laughs> The next step is called orange peel, and that is when it's kind of starting to fuse together into one surface, but there's still some lumps and bumps, and that's what we're shooting for. We're only firing to orange peel because we're working with many different colors of enamel, and those have different firing temps. If we were to fire them all fully, the lower firing enamels would be overfired and would pull away from the edges and make a mess for you, while the higher fire enamels might not even be past sugar fire. So by firing to orange peel, we're gonna ensure that all of our colors are fired, but none of them are overfired. We're gonna be firing our enamels at 1450. With this technique, it's really easy to accidentally overfire things, so I find it easier to run your kiln at a slightly lower temp than usual. Um, if you'll notice my kiln reads 16 or 1460, um, but it's actually running at 1450 it's been calibrated. I've got my piece on my sheet of mica and I'm going to place it on my firing rack here. I'm then going to use my enameling fork to place this piece into the kiln. A 
lucky for me, this cone's got a window, so it makes it super easy to keep an eye on things. And I'm gonna watch and look for that orange peel that we were talking about earlier. Okay. So what I just did there, um, some of your pieces are gonna be tempted to curl while they're in the kiln. And since you have to still pack consecutive layers and then need a smooth surface to pack on top of, um, it's best to flatten your enamel after each firing. I did so by placing the firing rack onto a heat resistant surface, pulled the mica off, and then squished it with another tile. All right. So while that one's cooling, we're gonna go ahead and revisit this other example. And this is gonna go basically exactly how the other one did. You're gonna use your brush to pick up the enamel and place it into those cells that you made. They're just a little bit larger this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish packing this, fire it, and then we'll catch up with it later. All right, once this is cooled completely, we're ready to bring it back over to the enameling station and add the second layer. So now we're ready for a second layer of enamel. As you can see, there's still plenty of room. We'll probably end up doing this two or three more times. And again, same as before, we're just filling the cell as evenly as we can. This guy's packed and ready to be fired again. Um, after that, you might have to repeat it another time or so, but what you're looking for is when all of your enamel is either at or slightly above the level of your metal. And on this guy, you can see that kind of orange peel texture where it's starting to smooth out, but there's still some bumps. From there, we're gonna move on to stony and sanding, which will bring you to this final even smooth surface. Now we're ready to stone our enamel. And when you're stoning enamel, you always want to work underwater. The best way to do that is by positioning a board over your sink with your piece positioned underneath the flow of water. We're stoning underwater for several reasons. The first of which being that the water will help act as a lubricant and decrease your chances of getting chips in your enamel. The other reason is it will keep you from inhaling harmful glass particles. We're going to have two stones that we're working with, one a more coarse grit and the other fine. Just like sandpaper, the smaller the number, the more toothy or gritty it is. And then as the number gets higher, the texture gets finer. So we're gonna be starting with our 120 stone. And you wanna use the 120 stone just to kind of remove the initial enamel that's on the metal and start to even out the surface. This is way more aggressive than sandpaper. So you don't wanna to do too much or put very deep scratches into your piece. In there. I'm going to use my non-dominant hand to kind of keep my piece from moving, and then I'm going to stone with my dominant hand. And I'm working in a circular pattern because it kind of helps you to stone it all evenly. And I'm trying to use a flat face of my stone because if I were to come in with a sharp point, I'll be making a very deep scratch so that'll be hard to get out, and I'm likely to gouge at my enamel. I'm just beginning to take down some of the enamel and even things out. Should sure rotate it some. Once this is starting to look sort of even, you'll flip it over and do the same to the back. Okay. So I've been sewing this for about five minutes or so, and I'm just about ready to move on to the next stone. All of the enamel has been removed from my metal and the surface is starting to get even. Um, there's still some high spots on the enamel, but we'll be able to take care of that with the next stone. We don't want to do too much work with the first stone because it is a higher grit and it's going to make some pretty deep scratches in your piece. I've been at this for about another five minutes or so and we are good to go. I'm done with the stones. We've got one smooth, even surface from the enamel to the metal. Everything's flat and looking good. Now that we're done stoning, we're ready to move on to sandpaper. 
We stoned in order to get rid of excess enamel, but in doing so, we created a bunch of scratches on the surface of the metal. So now we're gonna clean that up with sandpaper. We're gonna start with 240. I just fold it up, give it a little more, little more structural integrity. And again, same kind of circular motions. In this, you're just looking for an even surface. Your scratch marks should be decreasing and things should start to look like they're even and out. So once it looks like all the scratches from the stone have been reduced, we're gonna move on to the next level. And just like everything else that you've ever sanded, we're gonna work our way from 240 to 800 until all the scratches are gone. And then we're gonna finish things up with a polishing pad. This pair is wrapped up. I think they look great. And now it's time to move back to the pair that we were working on earlier. They've, again, they've been packed and fired four times and we're ready to stone them. So let's move over to the sink. All right, so just like before, we're starting with our 120 stone to take away a bulk of the enamel. Same rules apply, circular motion, avoiding any gouging points. And one thing that I didn't mention when I was stoning the first project that's good to know is if as you're stoning and you notice, oh man, you know, there's a low spot in my enamel, maybe I need to add some more, or you knock a chip of it out, you can return to the enameling steps and add some more. But before you do so, you're gonna wanna use a fiberglass brush. And say you've got, oh, I was stoning there, man, there's a chip, and I'm gonna have to add some more. Just use this brush and just really scrub out that surface. Because if you do, um, from stoning, you're gonna have these scratches in the enamel and if you skip this, you're gonna fire in those little particles from the stone and it's gonna make it all cloudy. And I'm scrubbing every place that I stoned, not just the one place that I'm adding enamel, because that enamel's gonna refuse too. So then if I wanted to, I'd be good to go back and add some enamel, and again, only fire to orange peel. So just as before, I'm gonna be doing this grip for about five minutes or so, and then I'm gonna to move to the 240 stone before moving on to the 240 sandpaper and working my way to 800. And then once you've done that, don't forget about your other side. <laughs> Flip them over and do the same. So I finished these two up with polishing pads just as I did these guys and then attached them with jump rings to the rollo chain that's connected to these snap settings. I'm really happy with the way that they turned out. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you'll give Plique Jour a try. I'd love to see what you do with it. Visit our learning center at cooltools.us for more cool jewelry making videos. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and be sure to sign up for our email list to be the first to hear about new videos, new products, and other cool stuff from Cool Tools.